policy support. So if we can just give our judges a warm round of applause. Uh, and we'd also like to give a warm welcome to the country director of UNDP, Ms. Verity Nyanga. Uh, she's come to join us. Uh, UNDP is um, currently supporting an initiative for innovation for development. So they really trying to support any social innovations or social enterprises that come out of um, out of some of your ideas. Um, we'd also like to give um, a warm welcome to our mentors who are here. Um, who have been helping the startups um, through the weekend. So much gratitude to you all. Um, before we get into the pitches, um, I just wanted to take the time to just um, verify what the tracks are, again, uh, for the global startup battle. So the first one that the startups can enter into after this weekend, uh, one is focusing on education entrepreneurship. The second one is the champions track for the top three teams. The third track is looking at women um, and any startups founded by women. Uh, the fourth is in kind, which is looking at any kind of social enterprise or social innovation. And the last one is the innovation track for anything that has been built on a we uh, web platform. Um, and then in terms of the prizes, locally, for the winning team, <coughs> they will get a one-year mentorship with the African Technology Trust, which is based in the Silicon Valley. They will get a one-year subscription for Evernote Premium for each member. There will be a one-year business internet package from UMAX and IP training and free trademark registration from Domsa and Komo Mutangi IP attorneys. And lastly, they will also get a one-year membership um, in the co-working space at HyperQ. So, without wasting any more time, I would like to introduce the first team who will be presenting, and that is a resident with a Z. So he will give you a notification when you have one minute. All right. And just for the audience, um, so each team has three minutes to present and the judges will have about ten minutes for any feedback and questions. All right, you ready? Afternoon ladies and gentlemen, we are team resident. Have you ever seen flowing sewer down the streets and you were like, I wish I could talk to the relevant authorities. And, but you failed to do that. Why? Because there is lack of communication. Well, if you feel you were useless that day, then you are not the only one. Well, we can do a research, and 88% of the 41 people we interviewed in the streets of Harare felt exactly the same way that you felt that day. Now, the 12% that succeeded in communicating with the city of Harare um, half of them got their responses way, way later after fixing the reported um, problem as a community. We collected and kept the numbers or the contact details of those guys that we communicated with for further valid validation. Now, we also interviewed the, um, well, the engineer, engineer Fuga, who is the um, Engineer Fuga was the director of, uh, of works in the city of Harare and he said they were willing to work with us, they are willing to have our app. Why? Because they use emails, they use uh, one billboard with this, which is at the town, town house there, and this is CPD, and they also use flyers and the media. And he also admitted that these channels are not effective in communicating with these, with these residents. Now, what are we trying to fix here? We're trying to fix the communication barrier between the residents and the councils. We also interviewed the um, mayor of Chitumbiza, who is uh, his, his worship, uh, Philip Mutoti. He always said to us, good governance is the involvement of citizens in the making of decisions that affect their day-to-day -day livelihood in a more transparent and accountable manner. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not happening here in our cities. This 
is what we are trying to solve. And what are we, we have as a solution? We have the Resident app. Hey guys, so we built a quick app over the weekend, very simple. So how it works is you pretty much, you see a, for example a burst pipe, you press the camera button, so you take a picture of the internet, and that's the it's geolocation, so it knows exactly where you are. So then, yeah, you press next, and then you can press to water work. It says which department is responsible, and yeah, so it shows you where it sent um, your email to. Exactly. And next I'll show you the, the next one, that's warning, which has warnings there. So for example, Ebola, they can warn people what time Ebola, they can share on social media, and traffic light breakdown, etc, etc. And news right there. So there's news where there's updates, where you can find out what's happening in your local area, or change areas if you need to. Fine. And the part also, oh, done. Oh, thank you. Resident. that we have, if the community is actually to give us feedback on where the critical areas are. And for example, the engineer of Fukuoka actually highlighted that there are some road intersections where traffic lights, if they do not work, they cause fatal accidents. So that communication is what they're looking for, where they can then direct resources to what they think is important. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, to a point. Do, do they have what it takes to filter the incoming information? Yes, we, on our side, we are able to also control because one of the limits that we put is um, the applicants, the people who get on the platform in the first place, we have minimum age and accountability as well, where we get the demographics of the person, the name, the content, so that we're also able to follow us if there's anything that we feel the person has done, which might be otherwise considered unreasonable in the setting of improving the city or any change that could be. Hi guys, um, I like right. your athletes, I actually mm -hmm. something that we do need. Mm -hmm. I think the presentation should have started off mm -hmm. with what you can do up with. Mm -hmm. um, we do understand what the issues are. I don't think we've got enough enough time to, to understand the functionality of the app. Um, just to follow up to Jeff's question, um, once, once the information has been sent through, what's your follow-up time and your follow-up procedures and process? Because you can send emails, we, we only got to the email part. But what are we going to do to, to, to make sure that, um, that, that, that the situation is handled or it's followed up with the city of, city of Alari or the relevant council? Um, the great thing about the application, if you notice, know, there's the news feed, the section where we talk about the news. And in that section, that's where we're saying that the council now has to communicate what it's done because it becomes very, very visible. And I mean, at least the fact that they are open to using the platform themselves, it means that they are open to fixing the situation. And through the news feed, they'll be able to inform you what have they done and you'll be able to track what hasn't been done. So which is also very helpful because the community can be able to say, hey, these guys are not doing their job because you always have that feedback too. Question, what do you think is the uh, in terms of accountability once you said you know you've highlighted this you know hasn't been done yet, the pipe hasn't been fixed. What is the next step? Well, the what we we going to use to try to fix that problem is the numbers. So as long as the city of RR, of which fortunately they are willing, they're open to this and they are, and they are willing to support it hundred percent. The good thing about that is that as long as you have traffic, a lot of people, when they know about it, if you notice that in the past, the reason why things don't get done is because people don't know about it. But it becomes harder. So we're saying that as much as they might think it's good for now, but as the traffic gets more and there's about 
if you then consider the over a million population which is in the country and the city, but then that's when, that's when you realize that those people are bargaining power. Those people, it's harder not to do your job. So we're saying uh, the point is communication. We want to be able to, if we free up the communication channel, we can be able to do it. How do you make money out of this thing? We have a monthly subscription that we charge the council and they're open to it. We already have disclosed to them that we will be charging monthly subscription and on our part we just have to invest in servers of which we've looked into the cost of some of the things that we'll be needing in order to complete this process. Have you worked on that, that financial model? What? Uh, yes, we have. Um, initially to start up, to get a server, we need something like $15,000 in order to get uh, right server and then for the developer would need maybe up to 5k so that we can have someone complete because this was merely a prototype but we need to build it and make it a concept and and then for um, the maintenance of the system it's something that as much as we can put it in profitability but maybe for cash flows until the thing has traction we're not willing to take anything out but we, we were expecting it all the time so that it's and, and the income uh, side is not the income side is the revenue from the councils. So Just how, we, how, are you, how are you working that out? We are going to be, it's based on the number of people in a, in a specific location. So for example, in Ahare, you find that the most, the council, the most people is going to, we're going to be charging them more. Of which you go to places like Mindura, it's very, you can't use a similar model to price something in Mindura because of the number of people. But it's not just the number of people, but also the dynamics of the city. So it's like we build in something like a scorecard where we then look at the various factors that we need to consider when we price something for them. But on the cost side, the, the incremental costs are very low because it's technology based. Once you have a server, incremental costs are low. Is it purely um, a mobile-based app, or because I'm trying to look, if you don't have a smartphone, mm -hmm. can you access this on, on the web? Have you thought about that um, and other ways to, to extract that information yes. if you don't have a mobile phone? If you don't have a mobile phone, well, primarily uh, the reason why we went to the mobile phone is we're saying that the number of people on mobile phones is becoming increasing. but. In order to actually make sure that any additional person who gets a mobile phone also gets on the application, we're putting a share. Uh, if you notice that there is the option to share using Facebook, WhatsApp, and so all these people, even though they don't have a mobile phone, they actually get to know about this application. So that whenever they do, of which we know that um, everybody's getting phone at an increasing rate. It's not, it's increasing. So we're saying that as long as we have this option for people to know that what they can get because of the sharing options where we're able to share it's easier for them when they get on the platform that they need to switch and they need to get the application on their phone does that answer your question Mr. Kambasha? Yeah. Awesome. One more question. So how will you um, tell the potential customers that this app exists? Um, Initially, we're going to we're going to start with the city of Harare, and it's good traction that we managed to get um, the director of works because he has said he has actually said that if you guys are serious, come to us, and we are serious about this, and we're going to we are definitely going to go there, and if we at least close it in Harare, it's easier to scale it up to other uh, councils in the country, and hopefully we're looking at not only Zimbabwe. But it's something which can be scalable to places like South Africa, or even the whole African market. I mean, who knows what the potential is, but that's where we're looking. Yeah. Thank you, residents. Um, our next team will be Muri Yetu, if you can prepare to come up. Just maybe for uh, some clarity for the audience in terms of what criteria the judges are looking at. Um, during the weekends, the startups have been working with the um, with the model, the business model canvas, which gives a holistic view of a business. So looking at revenue, cost, partners, uh, value proposition, your target market, um, and the nine various components in that. Um, there's also the aspect of execution and scalability, and a functioning prototype and how the prototype or the platform has been designed. Um, is it something that will appeal to the user and is it something that's actually addressing their problem?
Anyway, moving on, uh, we'll invite Mosleen to come and do a presentation on behalf of Moody Yeti. Gentlemen, we are Murietu. Your family is our family. In Zimbabwe, Kenta, people are dying. That's the problem. Because they do not have access to they do not have access to affordable cancer treatment. The solution is we are trying to provide an online crowd sourcing platform for cancer patients in Zimbabwe. Is this idea scalable in Zimbabwe? Is this real? Mostly, can you please tell them about Tendai? Tendai is a single mother of two. She's been diagnosed with um, early stages of breast cancer and she needs $5,000 for treatment. Now, she has a friend called Eza who knows about the platform through social media. So, Eza tells us about a story and we validate if the story is real and then when it is real, we post her profile on our platform. Now, with the help of our family, friends and our project supporters like public figures and artists, we will be able to get the word to the community so that we draw in um, donations. Now, for example, if a person doesn't have internet access, because we're an online platform, that person can be able to donate through their local, the, through our local um, wallet services like Ecocash, Telecash, and etc. So once they do donate, they'll be able to get a message that would confirm their donation, and they'll be able to get progress report of, ten, of um, from the time they actually donate the money to the time that Tendai successfully gets her treatment. Thank you, mostly. Is this idea a doable? Can we go with this into the market? Yes. Yesterday, we managed to talk to you about 20 people, and 80% of the people that we interviewed were for the idea. They actually pledged to donate, starting from a dollar, going up. We also managed to talk to people right in here. We have Dr. Mo. She has actually agreed on validating some of the patients that we're going to have. And about 30 people in here have agreed on donating, starting from two dollars, as long as the platform is up, as you can see from that slide. Some of the public figures that we managed to talk to were Dr. Diamond, uh, sorry, uh, Diamond, the singer, and we, we have also gotten confirmation from other singers. <laughs> and then, finally, what is it that we are? We are basically a commission-based trust and we are going to levy 6% on all successful cases. And right now what we are looking for is trying to scale up the idea and move on. For those who want to invest, we are working on a return on investment in between 15% and 20%. We are saying over the two years. Thank you. Basically, we are a social intervention organization. We are saying with your sisters, with the 6% that we are raising from successful projects, we hope to agree on giving you back 15 to 20% from the 6% that we are gaining. So we are saying we are working on a period of one to two years. Please explain, explain further how, how we get the 6%. The 6% is raised on, you remember Tendai, yeah. On Tendai, if we get to raise the 5,000, then the 6% of that, as long as our, our, our patients, we are getting in patients and people are donating, from that 6% over the, 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 the two years, we will then deduct 
the return on your investment. Say you have invested 10,000 yeah. and we are looking at 2,000. That's 20% of 10,000. And effectively fact that the cost of using EcoCash and all these, because all these services are not free? Yes, we did factor in those costs. Good afternoon. afternoon sir. Tell me why you can't just use an existing uh, crowdfunding platform to do this job. Um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to introduce something that, like like our name, we said Murietu, um, which means our family, your family. We wanted to do something that takes that in, uh, that encourages the community to be one to help um, a, a person that would have that would be the, uh, to help a cancer patient. So uh, we would we we did think of that option of actually integrating into something that's already existing, but we wanted to be the first platform that actually goes into the community and says we're not um, asking you to donate a thousand dollars, but we're asking for the whole community to do, donate as, as little as they can, but as as but as a, as a whole community, we donate as as little as you can, we'll be able to make the funds that are supposed to be. Um, uh, raised, yes. And who, who qualifies the patient? How, how do we know that the patient is real? Um, thank you for asking. We did, uh, we've got two, three doctors that we did um, uh, talk to during uh, the time we were actually making yes, making this whole idea. We've got Dr. Alma, who's actually here. We've got Dr. Piri, he's with the Ministry of Health. And then we have the third doctor, Dr. Timba, who also confirmed that they, once this platform is up and running, they've pledged their duties to actually validate that the cancer patient is real, so that we may be able to, um, what we may be able to actually uh, give the public um, true and real stories. Thanks. Uh, do you have a prototype? Yes, we do. Um, it was running through whilst we were doing our our uh, presentation. It's basically an online um, website that's already working and ready to actually start receiving funds. Yes. And what's in it for the donor? Um, for the donor, we did think about our value proposition and like we said, we are encouraging a community that takes care of itself. So the donor has um, the first guarantee is transparency. What we're saying is we're tapping into your heart for you to, one day maybe to be a family member. So what we want to do is we want to have a community that actually um, supports each other. So the first thing is transparency. That is what we are um, offering our customer, transparency. The second thing will be um, uh, the, the... The idea here is everyone in here is head of a friend or a relative who is been diagnosed with cancer and it's touching and you feel at one point you need to be to be seen to be doing something and we are appealing to, to people out there to open up their hearts. How do you reach them? How you, what's, the, what's the strategy to reach the donors? Uh, thank you. On, on that we are working on online. Currently we have a Twitter account that's actually running and we've been interacting with uh, people. We have about 79 and counting visitors since yesterday, I mean followers since yesterday. And we've interacted with them, we did our service also online with these people. They also pledged to work with us and actually give, share the word. We have uh, uh, Chat 263 has helped us. They've actually been on board and helping us publicize mobile learning platforms. Um, a lot of organizations that are there and also we're working sending out about texts to people who are actually interested uh, in working with us and other flyers, posters, working with organizations like churches, uh, other cancer trusts um, like Kids Can for example, we'll definitely be working with them. So we're just reaching to the community, even going to schools and talking to children so that they know because they have their parents that actually have cancer so that they can actually help also fundraise Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Next up, we have Getty. Oh, okay.
I think William should clarify that. Um, will you be able to explain to them? Okay, alright. So welcome, Getty. Good luck. <laughs> Morning, my name is Paul. We have a power problem in the region. In fact, we have a power problem in our area. We've all experienced power cuts from time to time. Do you want to know the power status at your house right now? Do you know the power status at your house right now? I'll give an example of my friend Brian. He doesn't know whether to go home to watch the game or stay in the office. Mr. Mkorombindo, who runs a few cold rooms in Masasa, always has to call the night watchman to see if there's electricity or not. We have solved the problem. We have introduced an SMS-based platform that notifies users of the power status in their home. It works by sending an SMS when power is disconnected, and sending an SMS when power has been restored. 85% of the people that we interviewed in Harare agreed that this was a service that they wanted. In fact, all of you, SMS, WhatsApp, or call your mates, your gardeners, your relatives at home to find out if there is power or not. Over and above that, the respondents agreed that they would want to pay for the service. So in terms of the kinds of people that we're looking uh, to buy into this service, we're looking at people, professionals, uh, who are earning about $400 who live in an urban area. Uh, we're also looking at corporates uh, who may want the information, companies like small manufacturing companies who want to schedule their production properly so that employees come when there is power. We're also looking at uh, realtors who want to promote certain areas over others because of the availability of power. In terms of our model, we're looking at a two-tier kind of model. We're looking at individuals or corporates who want to subscribe on an annual basis, and we, we believe that $5 a year is the figure that we can go for. I think some of you are already receiving SMSs about a light that was going on or off. You, you will at any, any point in time. We're also looking at a model where someone just wants to know the status of power day and then. We, we think that the 25 cents a week was, is what they they'll be, they'll, be, they'll be looking to pay for. At the present moment, we're estimating our setup cost to be around 31,000, and with our estimations, we would come to a break-even turnover, turnover in around 18 months, with approximately 9,700 subscribers. That's our key number. Uh, the mix would be, the majority would be in the five-year subscription because it's more cost-effective, and the minority in the 25 cents a week. Thank you. Again, thanks, guys. Um, can you just give me a breakdown of the 31,000? Um, what are the major costs in that 31,000? And how you got to that number? Okay. Uh, the main cost uh, relates to the power monitoring units uh, that send the information on the power status at the homes. At each unit uh, cost plus installation is around $200. And we are looking at positioning four units in each Zesa power grid in order to give us feedback. So that's the main cost. There's also the cost which we have limited in our projections in terms of um, acquisition of customers to around approximately 20% of our turnover. The average turnover that we are expecting uh, initially in the first year, average monthly, is around 3,000. So it will fluctuate uh, as, as, as um, as customers sign on. Uh, there is also uh, approximately $6,000 related to the development cost of the platform that will receive uh, this information. So that's, that's actually de um, development and hosting. For example, it's $375 to host with uh, Utani. Okay. Um, is, your, is your platform going to be 
historic in terms of can you tell me when electricity is going to go out that way for a business it would make sense for us not to decrease our production lines along the way so is it only going to be historic or is it going to be able to predict going forward so the plan is in the first six months uh, we're looking at that as a data collection period so we're looking at developing trends that we can then interpret for our corporates um, in terms of forward looking as you'd appreciate that would need uh, and I'm, I'm hesitant to discuss it right now because that would need more investment in development uh, developing an algorithm that then gives a prediction and I'm not comfortable at the present moment uh, going into that model because it is more complex and it is harder to, to give a pay in to. Give you some feedback. Yeah, yeah, this is completely unpredictable. I wouldn't waste your time and money on it. Just, uh, thank you. I think it's, uh, it's, as you can see everyone can relate to that. I think when we talk about predictability, we also know weather is not predictable. So one of the, our targets for the, from a future development point of view at the seven month mark is a widget on your phone which gives you an, a detail of probability of electricity availability. For the individual, you will also have a probability of a seven day forecast which will change based on data that is happening. We completely agree that this is unpredictable but I think having data makes it a little bit more pro predictable than not having any data. And right now, there's no data. <laughs> and there's no system. <laughs> tell, tell me, how many times a day do you think the average person will receive a message from you? <laughs> it depends on the area. In our financial average. projections... Average. Pick a number. Yes. Once a day, twice a day. In our financial projections, <laughs> in our financial projections, we estimated. Tell me your financial projections. <laughs> in our estimation, we have projected the worst case scenario of 30 times per month. Okay. However, one has to be cognizant of the fact that an SMS has a cost. Mm -hmm. So. The subscription value there for five dollars or two dollars uh, or twenty-five cents has a maximum number of SMSs that you can receive. Yeah. Now, if an if a client has exhausted their allocation due to no fault of their own because they're still getting from six pounds today. Absolutely. But you know where I'm going with this. But every business model, every business model has got a. Similarly, there are fair usage policies and terms and conditions related to any business. It, you, you can't have an unlimited... Just off the bat, I'd rather pay 10 bucks a year and know that I'll always get the message. <laughs> rather than 5 bucks a year and then I run out of this at halfway through. Jeff, thank you. you Can we take it? your $10 now? <laughs> Give me the app first. <laughs> it's, um, it's actually a, a topic that was heavily debated amongst us. Uh, and it's a fake. It's a fake point. Very, very, very fake question. Thank you. I think also um, we have to keep in mind this is minimum viable product. What we've tried today is create a minimum viable product. What we're trying, what we're planning to do is use that information to find more cost-effective ways to distribute that information. And you know about push notifications and things like that. So those are things we need to look at into the future. We use push notifications which don't currently have a cost. For example, I think um, Jeff, you're aware of those. No? Yeah. So I think that um, in terms of the, the, the problem that you're trying to solve, because obviously the, there's a power issue and you know you receive your notification, you stay at the office, you watch your football match, but then you go home and maybe you still have that power problem. So I'm not convinced that you, the problem is still there essentially. So have you really resolved your, the problem statement? At the present moment, there is all manner of randomness and inaccuracies related to the availability or non-availability of power. If you look at it uh, in a, as a whole, we're actually collecting information that could be useful in terms of power development going forward. The problem that we're ser serving is a problem that exists and where our potential clients have been using different methodologies to address it. There are certain clients who fit back and say, I'm not going to go until there's power, and I want to know when there's power. There are certain clients who say, 
look, I don't care about this product because I'm going home anyway. But we believe that there is a niche and there is a certain kind of client who requires this service because it's, it's, it's useful to them. And our indications thus far are that there are, these people exist and there are people who will be willing to pay for it. Have, have you thought about getting the breweries to sponsor your application? Because that will keep the people in the, in the bar longer. <laughs> We have, we have looked at uh, different kinds of entities to collaborate with us. Um, unfortunately, time is up. Thank you. <laughs>